The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Demand Forecasting, Looking Ahead Intelligently, Working Smarter Today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tim Green. I'm the Marketing Manager for Dunn Solutions Group, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. The presenter is Ken Krawczyk, Senior Manager, Predictive Analytics for Dunn Solutions Group, a longtime predictive analytics professional, and fair warning, a math wizard. Before we begin, I'd like you to look on the right-hand side of your screen and find the questions panel. Whenever you have a question, you may type it there, and we will answer them during the question and answer segment at the end of the presentation. Here is a look at our agenda for this one-hour webinar. We'll start by telling you briefly about Dunn Solutions Group. We'll provide a quick overview of predictive analytics, discuss demand forecasting and what it means to business, talk about demand forecasting methods, go through how to create a forecast model and the forecast itself, then use IBM SPSS Modeler to test our model and develop a forecast. We'll talk about real-world applications of demand forecasting and the benefits it can deliver, and then we'll finish up with Q&A. Here we go. Founded 22 years ago, Dunn Solutions Group is a full-service information technology consulting firm. We design, develop, and deliver a wide range of solutions using a variety of advanced tools, and we deliver those solutions worldwide through offices in Chicago, Minneapolis, Raleigh, Fort Lauderdale, and Bangalore, India. Our offerings fall into three practice areas. I'm sorry, we're having a technical problem. Here we go. Um, our offerings fall into three practice areas. Application development solutions, which includes custom application development, e-commerce, portals, and web design. Business intelligence solutions, which includes end-to-end -end BI solutions, dashboards, reporting and analytics, and other advanced BI capabilities. And, of course, predictive analytics. Package solutions, which includes software and services offerings for specific vertical markets or unique needs. And training solutions, which spans those three areas and includes classroom, on-site, and custom training as well as jumpstart programs and one-to-one -one mentoring. Our clients include some of the biggest names in American business, many mid-market companies, as well as a large number of governments and government agencies. Here are a few of our customers, including PepsiCo, Abbott, Bank of America, Kaiser Permanente, Allstate, City of Chicago, Progress Energy, and others. To offer our clients the most advanced solutions possible, we maintain close partnerships with industry-leading technology companies, including SAP and SAP Business Objects, IBM, SPSS, Microsoft, and others. And now, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Ken, Ken Krasik. Here we go. Ken? Yes. Thank you, Tim. Let me just accept it so you can see my screens. Okay. Can everybody see that? Tim? Yep, we can. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I want to walk through a few things in regard to predictive analytics, um, its importance, and how it, it works with demand forecasting, um, some of the methods, and we will look at a, a modeling example as well as creating a forecast. Um, now, what we've done throughout um, predictive analytics is we understand that organizations go through a series of stages uh, as they mature in their use of business intelligence. Uh, the first stage is mostly tactical as companies use reports to run their day-to-day -day business. These reports typically inform users of things like current inventory, sales, cost of goods sold, and they typically come directly from the organization's transactional system. Well, over time, managers and business executives want to have the ability to ask ad hoc data questions and try to figure out why things are happening in the organization. So they move on to the analysis level, which often leads to the need for a data warehouse to help facilitate better access to the data. Once leadership has a good idea of what their goals are, uh, they can move into the next phase, uh, which is monitoring establishing key performance indicators, or KPIs, and checking how they are doing against those indicators. More mature organizations create these KPIs at each level of the company and share performance goals and results with all employees. 
Now, all of these are really looking in the rearview mirror. So what if you can look into the future? What area of your business would you explore? How would you change your strategy or tactics? Well, predictive analytics allows organizations to model outcomes and make predictions that inform business decisions, changing and driving the way you run your business. Um, also, that most companies are probably making decisions on gut feel alone, uh, when in reality they may be based on ideas and metrics that are no longer true. Sometimes it's not evident what the factors are that influence the business outcome. Uh, this is when predictive analytics can improve your uh, decision-making ability by providing fact-based solutions. The core of predictive analytics relies on capturing relationships between the KPIs and the predicted variables from past occurrences and exploiting it to identify future opportunities. Predictive analytics is the process of discovering hidden patterns and to improve business performance and proactively gain a competitive edge. It's a framework for modeling business problems that involve uncertainty. Now with most business endeavors, data mining and predictive analytics are much more effective if done in a planned, systematic way. Even with cutting edge data mining and modeling tools, the majority of the work requires a knowledgeable business analyst to keep the process on track. Our approach to project management follows a model called cross-industry standard process for data mining. It's a structured approach to data mining and predictive analytics that can help ensure the project's success. As a methodology, it includes typical phases of a project, the tasks involved with each phase, and an explanation of the relationships uh, between these tasks. As a process model, it provides an overview of the data mining and predictive analytics lifestyle, life cycle. Um, Let's get into some of the demand forecasting and uh, its impact on the business. So predictive analytics um, can be applied in many areas of the organization. There are various problems and processes throughout the organization that predictive analytics can resolve or improve. Uh, all problems can't be solved by applying one modeling solution, which is why when using predictive analytics, we often leverage several different modeling techniques. Uh, they vary from predictive to descriptive to decision modeling. Um, in today's webinar, we'll be focusing on using predictive analytics to explore demand forecasting, its value, and how it can help improve several planning processes throughout the business. Uh, for example, you may want to predict the expected demand for a line of products or services in order to allocate resources for manufacturing or distribution. Because planning decisions takes time to implement, Forecasts are an essential tool in many planning processes. Methods of modeling time series assume that history repeats itself. If not exactly, then closely enough that by studying the past, you can make better decisions in the future. Well, using statistical modeling techniques, you can determine a range within which future values of the series are likely to fall. The results are more accurate forecasts on which to base your decisions. Now, it's also important when the forecast does not meet the customer demand, uh, because there's often a problem, because demand forecasts are typically a key input into uh, processes in many areas of the business. So for instance, buying too much um, exposes you to a potential losses from liquidating overstocks, um, and it also ties up cash and in inventory, which could be used more strategically in the business. Um, assigning too less resources may cause a lack of effectiveness and efficiency um, in the process and may cause safety problems. So if you purchase too many raw materials, you probably need extra storage and the unforeseen cost may push you over budget. So in the long run, the success of a business is related to how well you can foresee the future, which is related to how well you forecast processes managed. It's often that forecasting process is not optimal in meeting the current demands of the business. There are many reasons why companies often have trouble keeping up with the demand for accurate forecasts. For instance, the forecasting model may be maintained using 
various intricate spreadsheets which limit the ability to develop and evaluate models on a regular basis, as well as including all the parameters that affect the variable that you are predicting. Uh, the amount of data may be overwhelming, uh, and the relationships between the numerous parameters often create a complex problem. Also, it's quite possible that the process does not have the flexibility to explore several forecasts at a granular level, as well as capture the what-if scenarios using various levels of the parameters. Um, overall, besides the complexity of the time series process, there has been a resistance to change the process within the organization because of methodological and resource issues. Proceeding in the current manner will allow more budgeted dollars left on the table or result in the continuing struggle to change the business plan in the final quarter uh, to make the budget. So those are the reasons why the forecasting process uh, should include business intelligent experts that specialize in data modeling and predictive analytics. At Dunn Solutions Group, our analysts have advanced forecasting skills and use the most efficient and sophisticated software that includes several methods to produce robust models. Um, we know the appropriate method to use for each scenario, and we also educate our clients about every potential outcome. We can do the heavy statistical lifting, as well as providing the hands-on training. Prior to the analysis, we, we work with your organization to build a consolidated data store to allow users from different areas of the business to access all of the data and the same data, or let's call it the one version of the truth. So in order to build the one version of the truth, uh, there are several steps that require the expertise of a data architect. They have special skills for manipulating data in order to integrate the various pieces of data that exist throughout the organization. All internal and external data is included in the consolidated data store. Now once the, the data store is complete, the forecaster would extract data using a modeling software and proceed to examine the patterns and develop forecasting models. So now a crucial step in this process that will improve the accuracy of the modeling is to put the forecast into the data store once the forecast is final. This allows the forecaster to easily access the prior forecasts and use them to fix or calibrate the future models. Uh, the key to accurate demand forecasting is having accurate input data. And the key to having accurate input data is a business intelligence implementation. So let's move on to address the different methods um, a forecaster uses to understand the, the change in demand. Uh, well, from every uh, industry to industry, the relative importance of factors that affect a forecasting model will differ somewhat. If your business isn't one size fits all, then neither are the reasons that the demand for your product and services fluctuate. This is why we explore multiple methods to create a forecasting model. For instance, a prediction for next month could be the average of the preceding six months. Uh, the forecast could be based on using several charts and graphs that give us enough information to make a decision on customer demand. If you are dealing with multiple factors affecting the forecast, there are more complex quantitative procedures to use. Most often, all of these methods are used together to come up with the most accurate forecast. As we work through the, the methods, uh, we determine the elements of historical data that provide patterns that could explain the fluctuation in the time series. It's important to consider all variables that influence the historical data and would be helpful in making the predictions. Typically, before you conduct a quantitative analysis, it's wise to graph your time series to understand its qualitative properties. So studying the past behavior of a series will help you identify patterns and make better forecasts. When displayed on a graph, many time series exhibit one or more of the following features, either trend, seasonality, uh, cycles, and some irregular patterns. Now, some of the variables that may cause the fluctuation in the forecast are marketing events, inflation, and even the weather and holidays. So identifying a trend is a very important part of our analysis. A trend um, is a gradual upward or downward shift in the level of the series. 
or the tendency of the series values to increase or decrease over time. Notice that sometimes there are random movements in the trend that probably are difficult to explain why they are happening uh, with the qualitative approach. And these would be further examined using a quantitative approach. So the movements could be considered random at first, but then easily explained by its statistical relationship between other statistics that directly affect it. Um, an example of this type of statistic uh, with the noticeable trend is the economic indicator, uh, the gross domestic product, or GDP. Most of the time it's showing an upward trend with a sudden decline post-2008 that may look random. However, they can be explained by some of the components of the GDP. Here are consistent variations in the data that are not due to a specific time period. It's called a cyclical pattern, also referred to as a non-seasonal cycle. It is a repetitive, possibly unpredictable pattern in the series values. Non-seasonal cyclical patterns are difficult to model and generally increase uncertainty in forecasting. Well, generally speaking, we will need to apply many different approaches and models to identify the model that best fits the pattern. An example here would be possibly the cost of your gasoline or gallons of gasoline each week that you fill up your car. Uh, for instance, even if you fill up your, your car regularly on, on every Sunday, the cost and the gallons would fluctuate each week. So you consistently have um, patterns that fluctuate throughout time. Um, seasonal patterns are similar to cyclical, except there's a pattern due to time. Um, it's repetitive, predictable pattern in the series values. Uh, the, ser the seasonal cycles are tied to the interval of your series. For instance, uh, monthly data typically cycles over quarters and years. A monthly series might show a significant quarterly cycle with a low in the first quarter or a yearly cycle with a peak every December. So series that show a seasonal cycle are said to exhibit seasonality. Um, straightforward example uh, seasonality would be the weather, where the temperature is, is pretty high. Uh, it's at the highest value in the summertime and at the lowest in the winter. And this is very consistent uh, year over year. And possibly it could be uh, a trending downward. It depends on how you look at the numbers. Uh, so there could be some trend and seasonality, which also is a combination of patterns. And in this example, notice that the magnitude of the seasonal pattern, um, pretty much how wide uh, the fluctuation is, is consistent throughout time, as well as you have the the upward trend. Now, there are special cases, which is very common, if the magnitude of that fluctuation increases as time increases, it's called multiplicative seasonality. This is very typical in forecasting, and there are several techniques that suit this combination. Measuring seasonal patterns as well as uh, the various type of trends to improve a forecast it's quite difficult without using sophisticated methods that, that can blend several forecasting models. Um, for this example, uh, I would say something I read about uh, on the Bureau of the Census is that there would be the amount of pumpkins that Illinois grows on, a, on an annual basis. It's been steadily increasing and typically occurs around the same time each year. Um, so that's something that would exhibit different patterns that we can analyze uh, with our statistical tools. All right, so once we complete the qualitative analysis, we would then choose quantitative methods that are appropriate in modeling the historical data. Um, now there's an approach, there are, there are several steps to build a forecasting model. Um, as we build the models, we always collect data from each model that allows us to evaluate and compare them. Um, because the model performance varies for different methods, we always compare the fit and reliability of the prediction. Uh, we will address fit and reliable reliability uh, throughout the next slides. Um, we'll quickly go through these eight steps to address the relative performance in order to create the best model. Now, the first step is to um, divide the historical data into three data sets by using a time period. 
by splitting the whole, his historical data using years, uh, we create data sets re representing the previous years and last year. By creating three data sets, it gives us the ability to build, adjust, and evaluate the modeling results. This makes it possible to compare the prediction power of the different models. Data set one and two are created from the previous years and are considered the estimation period. Data set three is the last year and considered the validation period. We build and adjust models in the estimation period and evaluate the models in the validation period. So we name the historical data from uh, data set number one as the training data. The training data will be the, the data set used to build the model. Uh, data set two is not used to build the model in the estimation period, and it's called the testing data set, also known as the holdout sample of the estimation period. The testing data set is used to make adjustments to the training model um, from data set number one. Now, data set number three is, uh, will be used not to build the model, but it will be used to evaluate the performance of the model within the validation period. Um, this data set is also known as the holdout period uh, throughout the modeling process. So using different forecasting methods, um, we build separate models using the training data. Um, they are called training models. Now remember that a model is a set of rules, formulas, or equations that can be used to predict an outcome based upon a set of input fields or variables. Now this is important. Uh, we now apply the set of rules from the training model to the testing data set. Another way to say this is we score the testing data set using the training model to get the prediction values. The predictions from the testing data set will be compared to the predictions from the training data set to assess the error in building the training model. This comparison allows us to adjust the training model to be more accurate, resulting in an adjusted training model. Now we take the adjusted training model and we score the evaluation data set um, to produce predictions in the validation period. This step is very important to the process because it estimates how accurately a model performs in the future. So in both the estimation and the validation period, we calculate the prediction error um, and it is also known as the statistical error. It will be one of the measures that we will use to determine the best model. In the estimation period, um, the difference in the actual and predicted will address the fit of the model. So between the red line and the blue line, there's a gap, and that's going to be the error. So we will address how wide that error is using the statistic of the prediction error. Now in the validation period, that difference between actual and predicted will address the reliability of the model. Um, it's using data that the model has not seen and it's predicting the future. However, we do have the data. So it's, it's a comparison to assess reliability. Now, once we have those statistics for the several modeling methods, we would compare the fit and reliability to identify the best model. Now, once we create the best model, um, we follow more steps to create the forecast, to monitor the performance and adjust the model. This is a continuous cycle uh, where the monitoring process begins at every interval the data store is refreshed in order to get that actual versus predicted to assess the prediction error. If the forecast goes out of control, it's best to adjust the model. But even if the forecast is in control, it's best to always find a model that is better than the model that is currently working. So it's possible that new data sources became part of the data store after the best model was chosen these new data sources could help produce a more reliable and better fit model. That is why it's best to continuously build models even if the best model is working because there may be a, a better model. So let's go through these steps quickly in regard to um, the forecasting process. So once the best model is chosen, 
we create the forecast that as we apply the rules on the input data, um, typical forecasts only include time um, as the predictor. However, uh, there are methods that also use predictors that influence the variable you are attempting to forecast. The use of predictors when forecasting requires you to specify estimated values for those fields in the forecast period. That is, a series can be used as a predictor provided that the series extends as far into the future as you want to forecast and has complete data with no missing values. So the future could entail a combination of different values for the predictor variables. Therefore, there could be multiple forecasts. So after building the forecast, we examine the prediction interval, uh, which gives us an indication of the error at every time period. The prediction interval is a guide to keep your process in control. When we have a reliable and fit model, we need to address the margin of error in the forecast. It's calculated in a similar manner as the error in the estimation and validation periods. And in the forecast period, it's the statistic that assesses the accuracy of the model. As new data comes in, we can address the accuracy of the model by examining the forecast error. Um, it's important to have an accurate forecast. Uh, for example, um, it's used by the business in order to correct, in order to produce the correct amount of raw materials at the most opportune time, which would eliminate waste and lack of productivity. We would then create rules in regard to adjusting the model based upon the number of times or the magnitude that the forecast error gets out of range. If the forecast needs improvement, then we adjust the model by using the prior forecast error and the new historical data. So the process is also referred to as calibrating or fine-tuning the model. If the calibrated model doesn't produce the predictions with, within your specification limits prior to production, then it's a good idea to start over and build a new model using different methods. So really, can this process be done manually? Well, not without a lot of effort. So that's why we have software to help. Um, now let's go through an example uh, leveraging a sophisticated modeling tool that we use. Um, some of the modeling tools we use for modeling are the IBM SPSS Modeler and SAP Business Objects Predictive Workbench. So this example is forecasting retail sales for a men's clothing line. Um, we have data for 10 years and we're interested in the forecast for 2010. We also have data on the men's shoes, the women's, the women's line, some sporting goods, and jewelry. So let's move into the, the modeling tool that we'll use. I'm just trying to minimize this. OK, there we go. So this is the interface of the modeler tool that we use, which this um, connection of icons is a stream or like a workflow. Um, so this is already laid out for a modeling process where going quickly through these, this icon or node as it's called is an input node to, to extract the data from one of your drives. There's a time intervals node to put a timestamp on the data. Um, this icon produces a report or a Excel looking spreadsheet. Um, there's a filter to take out extraneous data. There is a graphing node, which we'll look at is going to be the first step of, of the process. There's a type node, which goes through some properties about uh, what variables should we include and when. Um, this, this icon is the time series modeling icon. Um, and then the nugget here is the uh, results of the model that you run through your process. Then there's more of filtering out extraneous values. And then this icon is to display the forecast after the model is built. So the first step in the process is to graph the time series. So this is the um, visual aid of the 10 years of data for the men's clothing line. Now, things that you, you ask yourself 
about this is, does the series have an overall trend, which we see that there is an overall trend? Uh, does the trend appear consistent? Is it dying out with time? Well, it seems to be fairly consistent on an upward trend. Does the series show seasonality? Well, it does appear to show seasonality, and there's some, there's some peaks that are on the vertical lines which turn out to be around December every year. Um, the, the values, the seasonality seems to increase over time, uh, and the series has a distinct seasonal pattern um, indicated by the vertical lines. Uh, the seasonal variations appear to grow, um, and within each of these characteristics, there are many methods that you choose in regard to if there's a linear trend or if there's an increase in the seasonality or the multiplicative seasonality. So let's, let's go to um, modeling this in regard to quantitative approach. So I'm going to go through some examples um, and use some statistical terms, so, so be prepared. Like, for instance, there's a, a method called exponential smoothing. Um, it's used for forecasting series that exhibit trend, seasonality, or both. Um, exponential smoothing is a method of forecasting that uses weighted values of previous series observations to predict the future values. So it looks at the preceding values and continuously takes averages of the preceding one month, two month, three month, and, and four month, and, and, and so forth. Um, so exponential smoothing, it's, it's not based on theoretical understanding of the data. It forecasts one point in time. Uh, the technique is useful for forecasting series that, that definitely exhibit both trend and seasonality. However, there are different models just for exponential smoothing techniques. So building an exponential smoothing model um, involves determining the model type and then obtaining the best fit parameters uh, for the model we chose. So. Let's look at let's look at uh, a first model in regard to the exponential smoothing method. Um, and the criteria, as you see, there are many methods that that you can choose, and it depends on how your data looks um, on the graphs. But just to go through some of these, we'll see how some of them, you know, do fit, some of them don't fit. So this is running using a simple exponential smoothing model. So you see that there's a trend that is increasing, which kind of fits the pattern. But definitely, the seasonality doesn't fit uh, the graph. So just initially, you can say that this, this simple exponential smoothing model is not going to be a good fit. So let's, let's work to another one. Another one we could look at as an example, there's a Holtz linear trend, which possibly will take into account the linear trend. But as we see, it doesn't take into account the seasonality. So as we go through a few of these, we'll get an idea of um, a simple seasonal model, which takes into account trend and seasonality. Now, as we go through each of these qualitatively, um, behind the scenes in the, in the Golden Nugget, there are uh, a bunch of statistics, um, either a simple approach or advanced, which all of these are the statistics that we use to quantitatively evaluate which model is better than, than the other. So here's the simple seasonal model. Okay, so this seems to fit the data a little better. It, it, it identifies those upward spikes, um, and it's definitely increasing and following the pattern. However, it's missing some of the bottom ones. Um, now, there, there was a lot of um, statistical preparation in the data um, in, in regard to creating it to be into the right format for this time series analysis. There is another step which we could actually consider these bottom two either outliers or really investigating the business as to was this, you know, was this a particular reason or not. So if we leave them in here, we want to try, try to find a model that really fits this. So it's fitting the top, but it's, it's not fitting the bottom. So we can, can continue um, 
looking at different models. There's a Winters additive, but there's a Winters multiplicative, which assumes multiplicative seasonality. So this appears to fit a little differently, and, and it also doesn't take into account uh, the downward uh, spike in, in the data. Now, there's, we can continue to do this, but there's output that we would look at to figure out which model is best. Um, there's a different approach, too, besides the exponential smoothing uh, method. It's a more complex structure, um, which we need to use called an ARIMA procedure, um, auto-regressive integrated moving average. I'm just going to call it ARIMA um, for this case. So it allows you to create a model suitable for fine-tuning model of time series. Um, it's a more sophisticated approach. It involves more um, statistical calculations. Um, it allows the added benefit, too, of including predictor variables, like the women's clothing um, and the jewelry and the, um, and the kitchen. So predictor series really um, it's related to the men's, men's clothing line. So within the node, there is a, a way to select the method as ARIMA. Now, there is criteria that you can, you can choose in regard to the three components of autoregressive difference in moving average and non-season or seasonal factors. All of these are determined based upon how your graph looks. So they all can be ones or ones or twos or threes. So for this case, we'll just keep them at ones and look at how the ARIMA model fits, fits the data. So it looks that it, it's hard to say just by looking at it that it fits a little better. Um, it picks up the spike in December, and it picks up the last spike in December. There's a little shift here in August or September that it doesn't really work too well. Um, so what we can do is just continue to um, change the criteria if we need to. And like I said, there's, there's reasons behind different scenarios. There's six combinations, so there's always um, a different approach to take throughout. So as we go through the process, um, we will see that there's different combinations. Now what we're going to do is, just for the sake of this illustration, because finding a model is, doesn't take you know, an hour or two. It, it could take a longer time. So we're going to consider this is our best model. And just for example, show you how to use the tool to predict um, the future sales for 2010. I just want to check some inputs. Okay. So in the time intervals node, there's a way that we can forecast. Um, I'm going to put 12 months. And like I said earlier, the predictors in the model um, have to have a future value. So I set them as the mean of recent points. So it continuously takes the mean of the uh, previous results. So in this case, um, from January 2010 and forward, um, it's just the red line and it's not over the blue. This is going to be the prediction. Um, so it kind of fits the same pattern a little bit. And throughout all the analysis, we, we can determine what's the best fit model and what's, what's the estimated uh, prediction error. And this will also have some prediction um, limits as well. So as we go through the process, um, we can see if our forecast is in or out of control. So this looks pretty good in regards to the forecast. Um, so throughout this quick process, we've modeled a complex time series, um, incorporating upward trend and some seasonal variation. Um, we've also seen through trial and error, you can get closer and closer to an accurate model um, which we, we have a close um, interpretation of a model to forecast future sales.
So I just want to walk through um, a few case studies that we have worked on in regard to demand forecasting. Um, we worked on um, a forecasting project in regard to using some economic indicators, kind of as I mentioned before about GDP and weather to predict electricity generation, which that in itself is a prediction on how much for this particular company, how much coal should they produce. So for every state, we had a forecasting model and how much electricity they would produce throughout the next five years. Um, so with this information, um, we, we ran several models and we determined particularly to which coal mine should we pull coal from or not based upon the cost of the coal mine. So the process really before this was using um, spreadsheets um, and it really didn't get down to the level of state. Um, and it was really at the national level where then they did a top-down approach. Um, so they kind of broke out the domestic to each state. Um, so there was definitely a uh, greater production efficiency in, in regard to turning over the forecasts. So before it was one or two people could create the forecast, but given the tool now, there's several people that can create several different forecasts um, you know, at the same time. So it definitely benefited uh, for this, this company. Now there's another one which, um, um, which we worked on that had, it was a special case in regard to the number of products, not just like the previous example where it was electricity or coal, we had over 250 products and then very, very many over 450 customer groups. So the forecasting methods change a little bit in regard to what do we do first? Well, we really couldn't do, you know, forecasting for each product because that would, that would be um, a lot of effort. So there are some steps you take in, in regard to grouping the products together. Uh, there could be commonalities between um, the products. For this, we had household cleaning and storage products. So we can use a cluster analysis, um, another statistical analysis, to group the products together. And as far as the customer groups go, we can do the same in regard to um, which ones are likely to, uh, to have the same patterns throughout the five or six years of data that we had. Um, and this was an example which it turned out that the forecast actually was integrated into the data warehouse, which is, um, is in the business objects reports for the demand planners, which is a great, uh, great success. Uh, because that's a huge step in regard to adjusting your your forecast um, that's going into production as well as correcting your model. So we were able to build uh, forecasts for the raw materials that they need to build uh, for the products and hopefully um, there would be less waste and fewer shortages. All right, so uh, some of the examples um, that we have experienced in regard to how demand forecasting affects the business um, is for sure less overstocks. Um, you don't have to discount or liquidate or have so much product um, sitting on the shelf. You don't have a lot of dollars that are just sitting there. Um, you don't have a lot of raw material surplus, and if you do buy too much, probably have to have more storage room, um, and there's additional cost for that, as well as man hours that are needed to um, stock the warehouse or move product from one area to the next just to fit certain products in, in, the, in the storage units. Um, customers are happy. You know, typically when products are available, they're very happy. They don't even realize that it takes a lot of effort to make sure that the product is available. But if it's not available, then they're very, very uh, un unsatisfied. So satisfying the customer is very important in regard to um, having these stocks on hand. Um, there's definitely a resource issue. Um, if you're working with a, a team of five and it should take a team of ten, uh, there could be some efficiency problems or some safety issues. Um, and definitely with new products, you need to have uh, your schedule um, 
tidy up in regard to ordering the new products and making sure everything fits. So, um, so that's what I have today um, to walk through predictive analytics and demand forecasting and the example. Um, we're going to take some questions. I think Tim um, is going to go through uh, some of Dunn Solutions Group predictive analytics services. Thanks, Ken. In a minute, we're going to answer questions. But first, I want to review our predictive analytics services. From data integration and cleansing to development and deployment to underlying BI capabilities and support, training, and software, we offer a complete predictive analytics package. Our projects start by working with you to identify areas for which demand forecasting can deliver significant benefit. Then, typically, we do a proof of concept pilot to test our approach and whether a bigger project will be successful. If the answer is yes, we expand the POC to a full project. And if the full project is successful, we help you determine other parts of the business that could see bigger profits, improved efficiency, lower costs, and more with better, more accurate forecasting. OK, now we're going to answer your questions. If you have a question, please enter it in the questions panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Please stand by while I go through them and select the ones that will be of interest to everybody online. And uh, while we wait for questions to come in, I want to tell you that we will pr pr uh, provide the presentation slides in an email that will go out to all attendees in the next day or so. And if everything worked properly, we'll also send a link to a recording of the webinar. Uh, here we go. Let's look at the questions. Uh, the first question, do, uh, excuse me, I have to read these in a small window. Do we need to have a data warehouse to make this uh, predictive uh, demand forecasting work? OK, Tim. So to answer that, it, it, you can say, I would say no and yes. No, you can build a forecast using you know, some spreadsheets or just some data that you pull into a modeling tool. However, it's, it's just you know, continually uh, moving, I would say, in the wrong direction because you have to have uh, not only accurate and secure data, but um, a data warehouse is very important in regard to the one version of the truth so that everybody within different departments you know, can evaluate the numbers the same way and look at that forecast. Um, it's, it's, quite, it's often that different areas of the business even have different methodologies of forecasting too, and not only just different data from the same organization. So it'll definitely, um, it's, it's, it's a must. I would say it's very important. All right. Next question, how easy is it to automate the forecasting streams, uh, basically which we're showing manually using the tool? Yeah. How easy is that to automate? Well, it depends. Uh, let's say the first time you, you have to go through the process. Um, and then once you identify a specific method, um, which we, we do that regularly here in regard to um, finding the right approach, um, then you can set up the stream to automatically run, though you got to make sure that that it's predicting you know accurately every month and month over month. Um, but it is it's possible to, to, yeah, it is possible to automate them. But you got to make sure that you got to find the right modeling tool or method first, and then you can and then you can run and and uh, model the outcome. But it's All very right. important to keep you know you got I would say keep you know keep an eye on it. Just don't let it go. All right, here's a follow-up question. Can you automate to auto-correction? Auto-correction. Uh, yes, if the, if the forecast um, is in the data warehouse and it's, I use the word frozen, if you can always access the previous, um, the previous months or the previous time forecast as what did we predict last month, if we do have that, we can we can set up uh, formulas um, in regard to the the modeling stream to make corrections. So, like if we're typically off, you know, 10% too much, either if it's higher or lower, we can make some adjustments on moving the model down. So it can be auto auto corrected, um, but sometimes it's best just to uh, consider different methods, possibly or different data as new data comes in. Uh, it may change. There could be a shift in the series. Unless it's consistent, then then you can keep it running. But um, you can definitely 
uh, script in the the auto calculation. All right. Next question. Uh, going back to your retail example, is there a limit to how many products you can include in, in your forecast? So the number of products um, that you can forecast, um, it's best to forecast them one at a time. But like one um, client that we worked with had you know over 250, we can bucket them or use a cluster analysis to bucket them into different groups. Um, so there's really no maximum, but once you, you know, you get, there's no real number, but once you get to a very large group, you may be missing some of the patterns. So you want to try and either intuitively put products together that look alike or use, use the numbers, the, the cluster analysis to do that. Um, so that's the variable that you're predicting. But on the other hand, there's the variables that you're going to use to predict which that could be, you know, 100 or 200 as well. Like our retail example had the men's shoes and the women's in the, the kitchen. You can have 20 or so variables, and there's another statistical approach to, um, to make sure the variables that you use to predict are the best ones. So it kind of it's, bo it's on both sides of the equation, if you want to call it that. All right. Uh, we'll pause a second here and see if we get any additional questions. Uh, please enter them. Up, oh, here's a question. Uh, how do you include events and promotions that have different effects? So basically, um, how does how do you uh, accommodate marketing um, activity? Yeah, it's um, you could do it in several ways. What we were going through in the ARIMA process, there's actually a, a tab or a section where you can put in when the event occurred, um, and, and the model is going to adjust for that. So if you do know that it's going to happen again next year, um, then you, you, know, you may want to keep that, uh, that into the model. Um, but there's other cases where you can build um, a set of variables that, that identify by each week or each month when the promotion occurred. And it's a statistical term. It's kind of, it's called dumb, dummy variables. Um, so basically, for you know, every January, you're going to have a number one. For February, you're going to have a zero. So you're going to create another data set that mimics when the promotions happened, so that the model knows that during that month, you know, there was a special promotion. So if it if it tends to go high or low, then there's a reason for that. And then we would see if it's significant or not because of that extra variable. OK. Uh, here's the uh, next question. When using an ARIMA model, is there a way to tell if a predictor variable is a leading predictor? A leading predictor. Well, it's probably um, good to look at, uh, the, the, I would say, the magnitude, I think, if this is right, about what the leading is, because people, I think they call it differently. Is, is there a way to weight? Is there, can you weight yeah, it's like the things more? It's like the regression equations where it's the magnitude of the, co the standardized coefficient, if that makes any sense. But it's more statistical speak. So you can identify which predictor you know, is, is the better predictor or it produces, um, you know, it has more power, I guess, over the, the forecast. OK. Uh, again, we'll pause a second to see if we get any additional questions. Stand by. You know what, Ken? It doesn't look like we have any more questions. So I think okay. we're, we're almost on the hour anyway. Uh, that wraps up the question and answer segment and the webinar. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Look in your email inbox for the presentation soon, along with a link to the webinar recording, which also will be available on our website, uh, dunsolutions.com. And keep an eye peeled for invitations to other upcoming live seminars and webinars. Thank you very much. We hope to see you soon online or in person.